All right, everyone, we are going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. I love uh, doing this part of the intro where we get to see where everyone's tuning in from. We got Benicia, San Francisco, Long Beach, Tahoe City, Sherman Oaks. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, my name is Leticia Palmadesi, but you guys can call me Tish or Leticia, whichever you prefer. I am part of the CDFW team that helps market and promote and do outreach for the Hunter Angler Recruit Retain Reactivate effort, also known as R3. And these harvest title hours that we do are a virtual program that we use to really engage with adult audiences just starting or returning to their journey in hunting, fishing, foraging, and the shooting sports. So the information that we provide during these huddles is really meant to help break through and break down some of those information barriers that are out there and really provide a confidence booster to you so you get out there more and want to participate in the R3 efforts um, that we do. So today we have two panelists that are going to talk about the what, when, and how of California fishing. Uh, somewhat a continued discussion from our previous fisheries discussion that we started a month ago on February 19th. Before we get started, we do have a couple of housekeeping um, items that I'm gonna go over with you. So first, for those of you that are new to Zoom, you can change the way your screen looks by clicking on the top right icons. There are two views, gallery and presenter. We recommend gallery view when many people are talking and then presenter view for when individual presenters are going. But you can feel free to play around with that. You can you know, mess around with that and it's not gonna affect anyone else's screens. So you do you. And at the end of this session, there is going to be an opportunity for audience participation. We really want you to utilize that. And how we're going to communicate with you is through the Q&A section of Zoom. And for that, that's down at the uh, bottom of your screen. It kind of looks like two little text bubbles. So just click on that. You open up a dialog box and then you're going to type in your question and hit enter. And then that's going to come to us, our moderators on the back end. And we're going to try to get through as many questions as we can. Also note, all of these sessions are recorded and available on our department's R3 webpage within a couple of days. Give us a couple of days to get it uploaded. Um, the website for that is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash R3, and we will put that in the chat box so it's easy for you just to copy and paste. There, there it is already. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. All right, um, included in that chat for you also, you can find all of our past R3H3 recordings under the California Wild Kitchen tab. Now to our team. On Q&A, answering your questions and fielding them to our presenters, we have CDFW R3 coordinator, Jen Benedict. And from our R3 team out of the Office of Communications Education Outreach, we have Robert Karam. Now, we do our best to answer everyone during the event, but if for some reason your question doesn't get answered or if it's kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about today, then just submit your question to our email and one of us will get back to you as soon as we can. The email is statewide R3 program at wildlife.ca.gov. And we will also put that in the chat for you as well. Now for our exciting presenters today, we have Lee Duckwall, which first of all, with a last name like that, I felt like he was like born to work at CDFW, right? Uh, he graduated from the University of Washington in 2011 with a degree in fisheries and aquatic science. His current position position is with the Heritage and Wild Trout Program at CDFW, and he works on conservation and management of California's trout species. Laura Moy, she joined CDFW in 2019 as an environmental scientist to develop a fisheries component for our SHARE program. Her goal is to create fishing opportunities on private lands by establishing partnerships with landowners. Flower has 14 years of ocean ecology research under her belt, but most recently had a fellowship with the state controller's office, focusing on developing a statewide strategy for California's blue economy. Flower is happiest near any body of water, which I mean, every flower is, right? Be it fresh or salt and is currently learning the art and associated frustration, those are her words, with fly fishing. <laughs> Thank you both Flower and Lee for being here today to share your experiences and expertise with all of us. We're gonna jump right in and um, for all of you, remember if questions come up, use that Q&A and we'll get those questions answered for you as soon as we can. With that, take it away, Lee and Flower. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Okay, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, so let's get started. So, yep, I'm Flower Moy and I am the Share Fisheries Coordinator. And I think I, I am just like some of you, I'm learning a certain type of fishing. Uh, I have a lot of ocean 
time under my belt, but I'm just recently getting started with fly fishing. And um, the photo on the left is my very first fish landed, not caught. We could talk about that difference. Um, but my the grip and grin photo is a little crazy. I've got like my line everywhere. So I was realizing like we need a R3, H3 about how to take photos with fish. Um, but the fish in my hand, that's the more um, zoomed in photo. That was my very first fish caught, landed, solo, all on fly. And that is a wild rainbow trout and it was very exciting for me. But I really just started all of this um, during COVID times because fishing actually became a really good socially distant activity for me. Uh, and so while it's not necessarily harvest because I am catching and releasing, um, I still feel like it's this new fishing uh, activity that I'm trying to get through. <laughs> and Lee, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Flower. Uh, yeah, that's always a pretty exciting moment when you first catch a, a fish in a new way for the first time. Um, yeah. yeah, so my name is Lee Duckwell. I'm an environmental scientist with the Heritage Wild Trout Program. Um, I've been an outdoor enthusiast for my entire life. Um, I've always enjoyed a number of outdoor uh, hobbies like backpacking, and surfing, and scuba diving. Um, and I've also uh, fished in some kind of capacity for my entire life. Um, and I think what I enjoy most about fishing is really seeing like the diversity of fish that California has. Um, I'm not too big into the, like hunting down some big trophy fish, um, but I, I really like going out and discovering some species that I, I have never seen before. And um, so I, I end up spending a lot of time up in the Sierras hunting down tiny little trout. Um, but that's the, kind of one of my favorite kinds of fishing. All right, so as we go through, let me know if you can't see the slides. <laughs> uh, great, so um, today we're gonna uh, go through the different things that you need to know um, for when you first get started uh, fishing. Um, so the first thing is buying a fishing license, um, what that entails, uh, what it does for you, and uh, kind of why the department requires it. Then we're going to go through some of the different resources that we have available for helping you get through this process of buying a license, going through regulations, um, some other resources to help you figure out what to fish for. Um, and then we're going to show you a couple of the incentive programs that the CDFW has created uh, to help encourage you to get out there and get fishing and help highlight some of the different opportunities that we have here in California. So exciting times. <laughs> fishing licenses. What is it and what does it do for me and for California? Importantly, a uh, fishing license is for everyone who is 16 years of age and older, and you must possess one of these when attempting to take any fish, shell shellfish, reptile, or amphibian in California. And the key word there is attempting <laughs> to take. You don't have to land a fish. Um, to be fishing. So if you're going to catch and release, Still consider fishing so you do still need a license. And what does it do for you? Well, it gives you permission to take these species um, and it is valid for one calendar year or the remainder of the calendar year if you purchase it after January 1st. This may change in the near future, so stay tuned with that note. Um, and license fees provide CDFW, the department, with funding to manage California's diverse fish, wildlife, and plant resources and the habitats on which they depend. So it's not just for ecological value, but also for the enjoyment of the public. And with nearly 40 million California residents and over 101 million acres of space, it's a big task for the department. So license fees are important. And they do adjust in response to the implicit price deflator, which means that they go up and down with inflation and deflation. So you may see an incremental change in the price in some years. And so how do you get one? Well, uh, the picture on the left is what I thought you might be interested in. This is what a fishing license looks like if you haven't seen one. They are on relatively indestructible paper, uh, <laughs> um, but I'm sure some of you could challenge that. Um, and the middle is a screenshot of our online license sales and service portal. I think it's the easiest way to buy a license, but um, if you don't have internet access, we could talk about the options later. Um, 
And really to find this, you can do an internet search of CDFW fishing license and it's gonna bring you to this website. Um, and I did wanna point out the uh, licensing agent tab. Um, there's a, a little tab you can go to that basically tells you where you can find a licensing agent in your area of where you wanna, of where you can buy um, a fishing license. Um, and if you don't have a credit card or you don't want to buy it online, that's where um, you can go into a store like such as um, Bass Pro or Outdoor World, Walmart, Turner's if you're in Southern California, some Walgreens and Rite Aids even sell fishing licenses and also your local CDFW regional office will be able to buy a uh, fishing license there. Um, and then secondly, I did want to point out that there is find a license guide um, link if you would like to purchase a guide and have someone take you out and kind of show you the ropes. Um, that'll let you search our database of all the licensed guides um, according to your location and your type of fish and experience that you want to go through. And then next, um, the that first red box, this is probably the type of license you're interested in. You'll see the top one says resident sport fishing license and it's for $52 and 66 cents. So that's for the 2021 year. And that's good in ocean and freshwater um, waters. And if you wanted to buy a one day license, it's $17. So if you think about it, if you're going at least three days a year, it really makes sense financially to buy the annual license. Um, and then what you also might be really interested in is that CDFW offers reduced fee sport fishing licenses to honorably discharge veterans with a service connected disability rating of at least 50% to recovering service members and to residents low income seniors who are at least 65 years of age. Um, but free licenses are available to eligible people who are blind, low income American Indians, and developmentally disabled persons, and also residents who permanently use mobility-related devices. So more information can be found on, on our website, and there's applications for those, and I really suggest checking it out if that's, um, if you think maybe you fall under that, it's, it's much cheaper um, and a way to go. And then secondly, I did wanna suggest um, a lifetime sport fishing license. Of course, it's more money out the gate, but when you do the calculations, you save a ton of money over time. And they make really great birthday gifts for kids. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a no-brainer if, if you've got a little one. Um, and also the perk is that even if you move out or leave the state of California, if you have that lifetime fishing license, you are still treated as a California resident anytime you come back and you wanna fish in the state. So that's a pretty good perk. And there are two free fishing days every year. In 2021, it's Saturday, July 3rd and Saturday, September 4th. So definitely take advantage of that. But just because you don't need a license to fish on those two days doesn't mean that you, it's a free for all. So just make sure to double check the regulations of that water that you're fishing and know your bag and possession limits for the different species that you're targeting. And we can talk about what the bag and possession limits mean later. Um, and also you can fish for free at any time of year off of public piers or jetties. And that means a structure that is surrounded by water on three sides and it does have to be a public area. Um, but just be careful. Uh, the top photo shows a jetty and you can imagine that if you don't check the tides or the forecast, things can get a little hairy. Um, so I would definitely suggest chatting with your local tackle shop or your regional office, um, checking up uh, the tide for that area, just so you know, and you're aware of uh, what's going on with the water um, during that time. So again, you can fish for free at any time of year off of those public piers and jetties. Just to kind of reiterate one point that Flower made there, those uh, regional offices that CDFW has are a really great reference if you ever have any questions um, for which license you need to buy. Um, sometimes it can be a little confusing. There are some specialty licenses if you want to go for salmon or sturgeon or something like that. So recommend calling in them and 
um, they can help you out. They sell hundreds of licenses all, all year. So they have a lot of really good advice. Um, so now that we've figured out how to get a license and we've gone ahead and bought that, now we need to figure out uh, what we want to fish for and how to do it and where to go. So California has a pretty endless number of fishing opportunities and it can be pretty overwhelming trying to figure out what to fish for. Um, there's almost 1,100 miles of coastline, 460,000 miles of rivers and streams, and 27,000 different ponds, lakes, and re reservoirs. So it can be pretty hard to figure out exactly where you want to go fishing. Um, but fortunately, there's also a lot of options that California has that are really great for people getting started. Um, there's a lot of really good options that are really simple gear setups that are also really cheap, really easy to use, and they're also really accessible. Uh, you don't have to go buy a boat or go backpack into some really remote wilderness area. Uh, there's some of these places like this, urban ponds or reservoirs uh, right off of here or jetty, like Flower mentioned, um, places that are really pretty much in our backyard, only cost a few dollars worth of gear to go and fish for. Uh, so we don't have a ton of time in this presentation to really go through all of these different species and opportunities that are out there. Um, but there have been a couple of really good harvest huddle hours already that have really gone into a lot of detail on this. So we want to just highlight a couple of those. Um, there is a really good intro to California inland fishing um, that really goes into kind of why to go out fishing um, and a little bit of where to go and what setups to use. There's also a really great one on tackle box basics that goes into a lot of detail. And then another one just on all the opportunities there are in the state. And so if you want to find these videos, you can go to the uh, Harvest Huddle or the R3 webpage. Um, and then there's a um, tab for California's Wild Kitchen and then a Harvest Huddle Hour dropdown list that'll have all the previous har Harvest Huddle Hours. So as Lee said, uh, one of the first ones, and actually I think it was the first Harvest Huddle Hour uh, was done in August of last year. And it was presented by Richard Munoz and Brian Young of Fishing in the City. And they are just super entertaining um, and definitely one to watch. And even though it's on inland fishing, it's really still applicable to statewide fishing and ocean fishing. Um, they talk a lot about gear. And um, I like how Brian talks about the love connection between rods and reels, and that starts at minute 27, almost minute 28. Um, they start talking about tackle and the differences between all of it uh, at minute 35. And then you can hear them talk about baits and different options for that at minute 39. Um, and something that I wanted to point out, and if you don't get a chance to watch it, is that in that lower left lower right corner of your screen, um, I did a screenshot of one of the combo rods and reels, and it's only for 15 bucks, and it's a medium weight rod, and really this type of setup, you can go anywhere in the state, and even in the ocean, and fish, and, and catch something, so it really doesn't have to be very expensive, um, and Richard and Brian also talk about how to keep things cheap, um, and, and where to look for with the cleared sales. <laughs> so, so feel free to check that one out. Um, and then the next one, Tackle Box Basics, Robin and Andrew really nail it. I was taking some screenshots of the video and I just maybe put too many on the slide, but I love how they really break it down, what the different types of hooks are, how much things can cost. Um, and, you know, it, depending on what kind of angler you want to be. Maybe you're the type of person that just wants to read the paper and fish, or maybe you want a little bit more activity to your fishing. Um, so, and, and then how to rig up your line. And so that's a really good one to watch. And so the freshwater gear starts at minute four-ish, and then the ocean gear begins at minute 21. And Andrew also goes over kayak fishing too. That's something you're interested in. Yeah, and I really liked how on that tackle box one, they kind of go through how much things cost and they, they really show you how cheap it is because a lot of fishing, like you really don't need any fancy gear. Um, a lot of fish really aren't very picky and you can catch them on almost anything. Um, I had a friend that actually attached a hook to a butter knife 
and caught a lean cod with that. As long as it's something shiny, they, <laughs> it seems to work. So it, it can be a really affordable hobby um, if you don't get too crazy with it. Uh, so uh, Michael Mamola and Farhat Bajalia did a really great um, presentation on the different fishing opportunities uh, across the state. Um, they really went into like where you can find each one, uh, a little bit on what gear to use and kind of what strategies. Uh, some, but the major takeaway really was how all these different opportunities are basically right in our backyard. Um, you really don't have to go very far to get to them. You don't have to go out and get any like too crazy gear. You don't have to go buy a boat or backpack into some remote area. Um, and so some of my favorite fish uh, that they kind of talked about are some of the different ground fish, like the rockfish here. Um, also some of the different trout. I really like fly fishing for trout and a lot of the small streams up in the mountains. Um, even though the fish are small, sometimes they get really packed into those waters. Uh, so it can be really fast action. You can catch a lot of fish really fast. There's some really cool trout up, up in the mountains there. Okay, so maybe you've watched those and now you know what species you want to catch. But the next thing you need to figure out are where to fish, when you can fish, and if there's any restrictions, because there may be some gear restrictions like barbless hooks and um, a barb is that extra little spike on the end of the hook. Um, and then maybe there's also different catch limits. So a daily bag limit and your possession limit. Um, so you're going to want to figure out how to look these things up. Um, and it probably does feel like there's a lot of restrictions, but the rules are in place to allow fishing to occur while balancing biological needs and achieving management goals. So um, hopefully this, these next few slides will help you navigate all of this a little bit easier. Um, we wanted to talk to you about a couple of different online resources that CDFW has. The first one is the fishing guide um, and something that I really love. Um, but across all of these, there is a Google Translator on each web page, and I'll show you how to find that later. So in case um, this language, it, it defaults to English, in case that isn't your main language or something that's easiest for you to interpret, you can always change it into a different language. Um, so first, the fishing guide, you can find it pretty simple by just internet search for CDFW fishing guide. There is a desktop version as well as a cell phone app interface, so you can bring it on the water if you want. Um, and this screenshot was actually done for the, the site um, currently, but it is undergoing some really great changes so that we can add more information to it um, and it'll just be easier to use um, as we move on um, with all the different regulations um, and the types of waters that you can find and the amenities that are associated with those waters. Um, the fish planning schedule is a data portal. You can search by water, you can search by county, and you can search by time period. So if you know you want to go out and fish in the next two weeks, um, you can search by that and see which waters are being planted. And you'll be able to tell uh, which species is being planted um, and which exact water body it is. And it'll give you a week's period of, of when that planting is going to occur. So you know that you got, you got a good chance of maybe getting a fish on your line. <laughs> um, and then of course, we have our regulations. There's the freshwater regulations and the ocean or marine regulations. And then there's a, a supplemental set of those. And it's all online now and in PDF form, which you can download onto your phone or tablet or any kind of device, whatever you kids are using these days. Um, and this digital format is part of the governor's directive to reduce paper usage and to lessen our impact on the environment. So it means that these booklets won't be printed um, anymore. So we all have to figure out the PDF version. Um, and then next we have two interfaces for regulation maps, and there is one for marine and one for freshwater. And the freshwater one is under construction for the next week or two. And just so you know, around March every year, that's when updates tend to occur for regulations and then the associated um, 
online resource. So you can expect a little bit of downtime on these sites in the future around March. Um, but of course, if you have any questions about regulations, you can always go to your regional office, give them a call, someone is going to answer and be able to answer any questions. Um, and then the next thing is that um, there has been a regulation simplification to streamline some things and Lee is going to get into some details for that. Yeah, so on uh, March 1st, uh, some new regulations went into effect. Um, they have simplified the inland um, trout waters regulations. Um, so the goal was to simplify it, make it more streamlined, make it a lot easier for anglers to understand while still maintaining some of our management goals. Uh, so they've gone and separated the inland trout waters from anadromous waters. Uh, anadromous is a term used to describe uh, fish that spawn in fresh water but then live some part of their life uh, in the ocean. Uh, so like salmon, steelhead, sturgeon, uh, striped bass. Um, so they've gone and separated those two and then they've simplified the inland trout portion right now. Um, so they've removed the uh, district reg regulations and put it all into the statewide regulations and then kind of consolidated some of those special fishing, uh, special regulation waters uh, to make those a little bit simpler as well. Which is awesome. We love it when regulations are simpler <laughs> and just easier to figure out. Okay, but they're not as scary as you think um, and definitely not as scary as this not anatomically correct angular fish. <laughs> but, um, so what we'd like to do now is walk you through two examples of how you would look up the regulations for a water that you're interested in. So I'll walk you through the first one. So let's say that you're interested in catching trout, which is one of the species that CDFW stocks. Um, it's relatively easy to catch, although relatively is dependent on the person, um, and you can catch it for food. That's what you're interested in. Um, and being in Sacramento, I know that I am near a lake called Rancho Seco Lake. So I'm interested in trout fish in Rancho Seco Lake. So what do I do first? Well, best thing is to navigate to that online PDF of uh, the freshwater regulations and just do a control F. So find the word Rancho Seco. And if it doesn't come up, that means that it's not listed as a water with special regulations. And I've done a screenshot here of the different waters from P to R, and it's in alphabetical order. And so Rancho Seco Lake does not occur. So um, it is not a special fishing regulations water. So that means that it falls underneath the statewide species regulations. And also in that freshwater PDF of our online regulations, um, in article four, that's where the species regulations start for statewide regulations. And so trout, um, it tells you which species can fall under there. Um, and then it also tells you that statewide, you are allowed five trout for your daily bag limit and 10 trout in possession. So your daily bag limit does mean the maximum that one person can take during that specified time. And the possession limit is the maximum number which may be lawfully possessed by one person. So maybe I have five in my freezer, but I can still fish for another five during that day. And so that would be my 10 in possession limit. So now I know that I can fish and take five trout that day when I go to Rancho Seco. Um, and it doesn't look like there's any gear restrictions either. And also, since it's not an anadromous water, I don't have to worry about looking that up because it is an inland water. And so the final thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to check out the fishing guide and the fish plant example. Both of the, these information, um, sorry, the fish planting schedule is linked to the fishing guide. So if you only really want to look at one, the fishing guide is probably the way to go. Um, and so I've done a screenshot of that of Rancho Seco Lake, and you will see that, yep, actually this week on 314, it was planted. And um, it also provides some comments on what type of water it is. Here it says a stable level lake in low rolling foothills in a park setting. It gives you some more information about RV sites, picnic sites, and other species that you can catch there as well as some of the amenities. It looks like it has a boat ramp and it is wheelchair accessible. 
So that's some of the other things that the fishing guide can provide with you. And then just because I like to see the information and maybe, um, you know, just double check, I do want to check out the fish planting schedule. I've looked it up by water name. So I've just typed in Rancho Seco Lake and I just asked for all the time periods so I can see when it's been stocked. And it looks like it's constantly stocked. So I know that <laughs> there's fish in there and I have a good chance. <laughs> and um, so if you have a different type of goal, maybe you're not really interested in trout, Lee can walk you through some ocean fishing. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Santa Cruz, so I fished the Santa Cruz Wharf a couple times when I was a little kid. Um, so I chose that as an example. Um, so the ocean in California, we've divided uh, for groundfish into five different zones. Um, a groundfish is kind of a general term that includes a number of different species. Uh, the most popular are rockfish, cabazon, uh, and lingcod. Uh, these are all really good fish. Um, they're large, they put up a good fight, and they taste really good. Um, so we split up the ocean into five management zones, and each of those zones is going to have a little bit different regulations um, for each species, since those species are distributed a little bit different, the, the regulations are a little different there. Um, so we can see that Santa Cruz is going to fall into that central management zone. And so then we'll look up, uh, for the second step, we'll look up the regulations for each species, and then it'll be divided within that for the management zone. Uh, so Underneath that map that's provided in the regulations, there's a really nice table that shows some of the general, kind of a general summary of what you go for. Uh, so you can see there that the rockfish are part of this rockfish cabazon greenland uh, complex. Um, and then you can see the open season. So we'd be fishing off a wharf. Uh, so that counts as shore-based angling. So it's open all year long. Um, the bag limit is 10 fish, and that's kind of a combination of those different species. Um, so you'll want to go and search for those individual species because within them they can have some bag limits on individual species uh, like cabazon is um, I think it was only two or three I kind of forget and then you can see the uh, size limit um, uh, limits there um, so I just listed off kind of the section numbers for a couple of the different species there so you want to check those out as well uh, the third third thing to check would be um, if you're inside any kind of marine protected area or marine preserve uh, where you might not be allowed to fish. Uh, so there's a nice map on the website uh, that will show you that. And it's also got GPS coordinates so you can um, get really, really accurate uh, knowledge of where you're allowed to fish. Uh, so you can see the Santa Cruz Wharf doesn't fall in any of those zones. Um, so we're okay fishing there. And then the last thing is just to bring a good fish ID guide. Um, there are some good pictures in the regulations that can be really helpful, uh, but you just want to be pretty careful what you're catching. Make sure you know what species you're getting. Make sure you're not catching anything that you're not allowed to get. Uh, one of the really fun things about fishing in the ocean is that there's so many different species and anytime you drop your lure in, you never really know what you're gonna get. So it's, it can be really exciting, but you just wanna make sure that you're getting the right stuff. Okay, so finally, we have some programs that we'd like to share with you. And these are pretty great programs. Um, Lee's gonna take the screen and we're gonna actually show you the actual website. So go for it. Okay, so the first is Fishing in the City. And this aims to bring fishing to Californians living in urban and suburban areas. There are fish plants that occur with clinics and they'll bring rods and reels and there are representatives from CDFW there to help you figure out how to actually fish um, and to practice. Um, and usually people are pretty lucky and you can walk away with a fish or two. It's not just for kids, anyone can participate. Um, and some of the cool things about fishing in the city um, I'd like to point out one of the things is the learn to fish online. There are videos that they do. It's, um, it's that little link under learn to fish online. Lots of videos that are targeted at adults, but also adults who are trying to teach kids the basics of fishing. So if that um, 
is something you're interested in, definitely check them out. Really, really good videos. Uh, and each area does offer some slightly different uh, features. So Sacramento, yep, we're in Sacramento. Um, and if you scroll down, Sacramento area does have a ROD loan program. So you can borrow a loan if you, uh, a ROD if you don't have one. Um, and I would definitely check out some of the other locations and you can see what is in your area and when they have um, different clinics scheduled. Um, and then before we move on, I do want to point out in the top right corner, there's a little world um, button, and that is the Google Translate. And if you click on that, you can translate each page into whatever language you'd like. So that's where um, you, can, you can adjust to that. Um, and so the next program I'd like to tell you about is the Trophy Black Bass Program. And there are four different species that fall under this program. And this page can give you a little bit more information on um, the, the different rules and regulations of the program. Um, and we'll send out all of these links later in a follow-up email, so don't, don't need to scribble it down. Um, but the cool thing about this program is that if you do catch a trophy bass, the application is super simple. Um, you just need to send that in with some supporting documentation, maybe a photograph, because let's be honest, we're all taking pictures with a trophy pass. Um, maybe it's a news item, maybe you got your photo in the newspaper, um, or a weight slip, um, and send that in, and you get a certification, a little certificate that's claimable. And if you've released the fish back into the water, you also get a pin. Um, and there's no limit to the number of pins you can get or certificates you can get, and you can get one or more for each species. So it's kind of a fun way um, and you know, gives you bragging rights too. Um, and let's see, the next program is the Heritage Trout Challenge. All right, so the Heritage Trout Challenge was created by the Heritage and Wild Trout Program uh, to highlight um, some of our native trout species across the state. And so you accomplish this challenge by catching six of the native trout within their native drainages. Uh, we actually have 11 different species, um, but you just have to get six for the uh, challenge. Um, and so when you win, you get a really cool hat that says Trout Challenge on it. And then you also get a really nice certificate um, with uh, drawings by uh, the artist Joseph Tomaleri of all the fish that you caught. Um, so it's like a really nice big certificate. It's designed to be framed. Uh, it's it's really nice. Um, and so that's that's a really cool challenge. And it's a really good opportunity to get out all over the state. Um, we've had a lot of really cool stories that have come from it. Some people make it uh, kind of an epic summer uh, by catching them all in one summer. Um, and then some people try and do it like over a long period of time. So we have people that have spent over a decade working on it. Other Families have all done it together. So sometimes we'll get applications from a whole family of people with their little kids and both parents. So it's a really cool opportunity and a lot of great, great stories and adventures have come out of this one. Yeah, I really like this program, especially because it really ties the fish in with its native area. And, you know, it, it does take some effort to catch these special fish. Um, and it, it just helps you connect with the natural history um, and it makes you go into some places that you might not have traveled, you know, if you were just trying to catch trout in general. So I think it's, it's super cool. I've seen, uh, I've talked to people who have completed it multiple times. There's you know, not a limit to how many times you can complete it. You do have to catch separate fish each time, but um, yeah, it's a really cool program. And uh, I almost forgot to mention uh, a couple of years ago, we put out this really cool guide to the trout challenge. Um, and this goes through, Every species that we have, it goes through where you can catch them, um, a little bit on what flies to use or what other lures, um, and some strategies to catch them. It's a really cool resource. Uh, a lot of really good work went into it. Um, so I really encourage anyone to check that out. Um, it's, it's really neat. It's a lot of information. So finally, the last program and um, my personal program, I guess, is the SHARE program the Shared Habitat Alliance for Recreational Enhancement. 
And it is a hunting program that was established 10 years ago, but now I've come on to develop the fishing component. So under the program information tab, you'll see some general program information. Um, it is a, um, it, the opportunities are one through random drawings. And the main goal is to work with landowners to open up their property for very controlled and limited access. Um, and so really it's a win-win for everyone involved. Oh, win-win-win. Maybe there's three wins in there. The landowner receives financial compensation and full liability coverage. The public gets access to really special and unique fishing opportunities. And the land hopefully receives that money in the form of habitat improvements and fishery enhancement projects. Um, and so if you click on that fishing tab, you'll see that here, when there are opportunities available, they'll be posted here. Um, but to, I really just encourage you to check back. I'm in conversation with three different properties that will hopefully have opportunities um, by summer. So it is, it is a really cool opportunity. Um, and it's not just for those expert anglers, it's for beginners as well. It's for families, um, or it's just um, for that solo person that just wants that whole stretch of river to themselves. So there's gonna be lots of different opportunities offered here. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And it, because it is um, through a random drawing, you do have to apply, um, but it's a simple application and a small application fee. So feel free to check out that website. Okay. So let's see. All right. I think I've successfully stolen the screen back. Okay. Um, and so Finally, we just want to say, go out there and try it. Um, fishing, just like any other skill takes practice. Um, and really just getting out to the water is half the battle. <laughs> um, but mentorship is always a great thing. If you know that somebody fishes, just asking them where they go or if they could take you the next time might be the first step. Um, and for me, it's been talking to the people that are in the fly fishing shops. They love telling you about anything you wanna know. So schedule some time, uh, but you know, they're just really knowledgeable and they're really into it too. And they wanna share that knowledge. Um, so I would definitely start with those fly shops or any other tackle shop. Um, there's people in there that, that know. Um, and then, of course, an email will be sent out with all those links that we mentioned. Um, so you can dig around and, on our online resources and, and check those out a little more. Um, and, of course, you can always email R3 or go into your regional office. Yeah, thank you for uh, listening to our presentation today. I, I hope it uh, inspired you guys to get out there and try some new things fishing. Um, and ready for any questions that you guys might have. Yeah, thanks. You guys, that was fantastic. And we do have quite a few questions. So I'm gonna just jump right in so we can get to a majority of them. And if we don't get to your question, then remember um, you can always email us and we'll try to point you in the direction of the answer there. So first you guys um, talked a little bit about the free fishing days, but does CDFW organize any other fishing events or how do you suggest beginners connect? to others. You kind of just mentioned that flower, but any tips on how you find a mentor? Mm, well, uh, there's probably people around you that fish that might not talk about it. Um, so you, know, you never know until you ask. Um, that's what I started doing was just asking people if, if they fish. Uh, but also the Fishing in the City program really is a great resource. Not only do they stock fish, but they bring all the gear and there are instructors there to talk you through it. <laughs> um, and so that, that is a, a really great resource to use. Um, something else you mentioned was, you know, you, you go to talk, tackle shops. We had someone question it, or send a question in that said, they're kind of overwhelmed when they go to the tackle shop and sometimes feel like uh, the, the people there are talking over them or only want to talk to their husband. Um, mm -hmm. Ha any advice for where you go to get um, info on tackle setup? I understand that. Um, <laughs> I try to go in with the 
with the most knowledge that I can. So I tell them, I want to fish this exact water. I'm going to fish it at this time of year because, you know, that's when I have time off of work or that's when the kids are in school. Um, and I have this type of rod that I'm looking at, you know, my $15 rod and reel combo. Um, and, you know, you can spend as much money as you want, but really you don't need that much. And so if you find the right person to talk to, there's always one or two people that might not mesh with you in those tackle shops, but there are plenty of others that I, that I know can get on your level um, and chat with you about what kind of gear you might want and the cheapest way to go. Of course, they're in it to make some money, but they're also in it to help you have that experience because they know how good it is to, when there's a fish on the end of your line. So um, I'd encourage you to have patience because um, when you walk into those shops, it is really crazy, but knowing where you want to go, what you want to catch and when you want to go will help you narrow it down because I mean, you there's, it's endless. It's true. So yeah. just knowing what you want um, can help you ask the right questions and then help them inform you right. of what the best gear is and the cheapest way to go. Now the tackle box, uh, R3H3 is, did a really good job as well. So I recommend watching that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good place okay. to start. Yeah. And Thank I would say advice. a lot of times when you do go into a tackle shop, sometimes they will just like give you every possible option on like if you say you want to catch a trout in a lake they'll give you every single lure and every single type of bait and tell you all these things or what you need to catch it and I, I would stick with one or two and and give that a shot and if it doesn't work maybe go back or try try something else but don't go and buy everything and um you know don't don't go to spend an hour and do two casts with 20 different kinds of gear like spend a little time with each one and really get to know that that piece of equipment. Yeah, and also because California is made up of lots of different ecosystems. So it is good to go to your local shops mm -hmm. or the local shop of where you'll be fishing um, because they have the knowledge of what you might need, but they'll also know what you can get by with. So yeah, the local knowledge is priceless. Good advice, guys. Um, here's another one. When you started out fishing, what did you struggle with the most and what advice would you have to our audience so they don't struggle with those same things? Lee, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, I think sometimes it's easy to get a little bit frustrated or discouraged. Um, I know like especially when I started fly fishing, I feel like there's a, a lot of technique in that one. Um, and I, I just always got tangled on every shrub around me. And it seemed like by the time I would get my fly into the right spot, I had scared every fish. And so it, it can be really frustrating. Um, and so I would say like, you know, start with some easy stuff and some easy places first. Don't jump right into like the most difficult kind of fishing. Um, you know, get, get your hands on some fish first and catch, catch a few fish um, before trying something really difficult. Um, otherwise, you might just get kind of discouraged from the get-go. Very true, yeah. The, the thing that I didn't realize was how long it takes to set up my gear. And maybe it's because I'm so slow at tying knots. But, you know, yeah, half the battle is getting to the site and then getting the hook on the line <laughs> is, is rough too. And just knowing that that's part of the fishing. It's not always about the hook in the water. And I know that's not what you want to hear probably, but you know, the whole act of fishing is really the setup of the gear um, and, and the ritual that comes with it. So um, that, yeah, I, I've just embraced that and, and getting snared and having to cut off the line and losing that lure and you know, you're, you're gonna lose the gear. So that's why you should just start with the cheap stuff. Um, so. we, we just had a good question come in just based off of what you're talking about. Someone <laughs> wrote in, I'm scared to touch the fish once it's on the line. Can I use a towel or what do you recommend? How can I tell if it'll bite me? <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> well, the fish don't generally look like that, that cartoon angler fish. Um, <laughs> but if you're catching and releasing, um, versus keeping it for food. Um, there are two different types of techniques. If you're going to release the fish, it's best that you, you treat it very nicely and try to keep it in the water as much as possible. Um, 
And it's not good to touch it with a towel um, because that takes off the mucus from their scales. And when that mucus is gone, it's easier for the fish to get an infection, to get sick um, and, and possibly die. So it's, it's best to touch it as, as least as possible. Um, but if you're taking it um, for food and um, you, you can always put a glove on, they do make some gloves like the one that I'm wearing in the, in the photo. Um, but really just shoving your thumb into its mouth and grabbing it um, underneath its chin and just get your thumb in there and squeeze. It's, it doesn't bite you and, and cut you and hurt you. I mean, if anything, it's going to flip its tail. Um, and that's where you might get smacked in the face if you're trying to sleep <laughs> with the fish. But what a um, story that would make, right? Yeah. Slapped in the face <laughs> <with the fish. laughs> yeah. But um, they are slippery little buggers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, having a net is really good too. It's, it's it's easy to just net the fish and then, you know, it's, it's being handled um, and then you have more control over it too. Lee, do you have any suggestions? Um, yeah, I was going to say a net. Um, there's some good little landing nets that are um, pretty safe for the fish too and are, are good for not really removing that slime too too much off of them. Um, then you can also get a pair of pliers. Um, so you can get them in the net and then use the pliers on the hook and you can pop that out. Now that, that works pretty well. Mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah. a good one. All right, um, fishing reports. Can you recommend fishing reports, especially for ocean beach fishing and striped bass? I don't know any specific ones. Um, a lot of like outdoor stores or um, fishing stores provide their own for an area. Um, so that's what I've used in the past. Uh, a lot of people will go in and, you know, report what they got or some, some stores have a scale out there and uh, they'll take pictures of people and post them and they'll, they'll give really nice updates. Um, and that'll give you a really good kind of local knowledge of what's going on at that, that time. So some stores can be really good for that. Um, I, I don't have any just like big websites off the top of my head, but I, I would check like local stores in the area would be my, my advice. I definitely, yeah, I think that that's probably where you'd find those fishing reports. Um, I spent a lot of time in Monterey Bay and yeah, those, those fishing guides and the, the outfitters do post that kind of stuff. So you'd have to find it online if you have internet access, but um, looking at their web pages or Facebooks I and mean, people like to, to post that kind of stuff. Um, oh yeah. You know, for bragging rights. <laughs> yep. Um, Flower, you mentioned uh, weight slips in your uh, discussion that you had. Can you tell us about that? What, what does that mean? And can you weigh any fish? Yes, you can weigh any fish. Um, there are scales that are meant strictly for derbies, for fishing contests. Um, they are usually found at marinas if you are fishing on a lake or reservoir. Um, not everyone has those just readily available, you know, in, in your garage. It's, it's not something um, that people usually have, but marinas tend to carry them. Um, so when you do catch a fish, if you have a live well and you wanna, you wanna weigh your trophy bass, um, you can bring your fish in and they'll weigh it for you. Um, and then you can release it back to the water but there is an official scale that you can use. Um, and then something that we've to toyed with the idea of, especially with the Trophy Bass program is um, using length because now we know how big a fish is, uh, is relative to its age and its size. So um, it depends on the species, but you don't always have to use weight. Um, sometimes length is appropriate for oh. the contest. Okay, um, we have one more question. Um, I wanna get into stream fishing for trout. I always get my lures caught in the trees and bushes or the other side of the stream. How can I get better at casting? <laughs> Is there a trick to getting your line to where you want it to go or that something you could sum up quickly for someone? Gosh, I totally feel your pain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, looking behind you helps. I have hooked my buddy in the back, my mentor in the back one time. Um, yeah, so you don't actually have to go all the way back. It's just to like the two o'clock uh, before the release. So it's, it's not fully flinging it back. You don't actually have to go back as far. But the hula hoop in the grass uh, and your front lawn 
is a good way of practicing and fun for kids too, um, not just adults. Uh, but yeah, it's practicing with that gear over and over and over again. And it is a perishable skill. So you do have to keep practicing <laughs> throughout your life. I know. Yeah, unfortunately, practice is kind of the main, the main advice for that one, I'd say. Um, a little bit of your site selection can help a lot too. Um, picking a spot where you know is a little bit more open, you know, looking behind you. If maybe if you're just in an open grass and area, grassy area, that's a lot better. Try to try to avoid spots that have all those trees. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's easy. You see the fish in there and you want to go for it, but it, it turns out it's actually a pretty hard fish to go for. Um, so I'd kind of target those areas that are a little bit easier, especially when you're getting started. Definitely. And I do have waders, but um, if you have something like that or big boots, I do stand in the water and I'll cast upstream so that I'm not fully standing on the bank and close to the shrub. And that's how I've given myself space because I will get tangled. <laughs> Well, it's so nice to hear that, like, you know, even though you guys have been doing this a while, you're, you're still having some of the, the issues that beginners have. So it's kind of, you know, bringing us all together <laughs> here, yeah. full circle. Yeah, well, um, it is 1259, uh, Flower Lee, thank you guys so much. Our time together is up. Uh, if I think we got to most of the questions, but if you didn't get your question answered, go ahead, please remember, you can always find us on the um, R3 page and that might help you um, answer any of your questions. Or, you know, if you just wanna come right to us for an answer, you can email us um, at the statewide R3 program and that um, we'll, we'll put that email address in the chat for you one last time. We put it in earlier, but just so it's not, you're not scrolling through all of that. We hope that you can join us for our next R3H3 session, which will cover our first shooting sports topic. That's gonna to be on April 2nd and we'll cover shotgun fit. And then um, after that, we're gonna have a beginning look at halibut um, fishing and Sandy beach surf fishing on April 16th. So registration is now open um, for, the, for our next one. And then soon we'll be posting all of the links so you can register and kind of see what we have up and coming and pick and choose which one you wanna to come to. You can find those um, links in a few days, either by visiting the R3 calendar or by watching our social media or signing up to receive our monthly hunter angler updates. Um, you do that through our online licensing portal. Additionally, when you visit the event registration page, we want you to take a look at all of our advanced hunting clinics that we offer. And if you're um, thinking about getting into hunting, maybe you know, pick and choose which, which you might wanna do once you get your hunting license. And lastly, a big shout out to our presenters, Flower, Lee, thank you so much. And then also our support behind the scenes. A uh, huge thank you for everyone that spent their lunch hour with us. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed being here for you. This session's recording, again, will be available on the R3 page in the coming days. But until it's up and until we see you in two weeks, we hope you have a great Friday and a great weekend. And thank you for being with us today. Bye.